Welcome everybody. Um, this is the third day of ANC's uh, sixth annual One Health Conference hosted by the Ann and Charles Johnson One Health Institute. Um, so for those who are joining us for the very first time, I'll just go over a little bit of what we mean by One Health. So One Health, uh, the One Health concept recognizes the connection between human and animal medicine and advocates a comprehensive approach to health and environmental problems. It aims to build bridges between physicians, veterinarians, environmental scientists, and public health professionals to promote, improve, and defend the health and well-being of all species. So the Anna Charles Johnson One Health Institute at the Animal Medical Center allows our veterinarians to continue to work collaboratively um, through research to help advance both veterinary and human medicine. Um, and this is the sixth year we're hosting our One Health Conference and our first year hosting it virtually. Um, and so we're bringing together um, professionals in both human and veterinary medicine to learn and engage with topics that affect all of our patients. Um, so what we're going to be talking about tonight um, is dietary supplements for osteoarthritis. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker for the night, Jason Machowski. Um, so Jason is a board certified sports dietitian and registered clinical exercise physiologist who specializes in working with people post rehab to return to sports training or daily activities. He also specializes in nutrition and exercise guidance for those looking to maintain bone health. In his 14 plus year career, including eight at the hospital for special surgery, he has provided nutrition and training guidance to individuals encompassing a broad range of ages, exercise, experience, injury history, sport and recreation. Jason is also a reviewer for the nutrition and rehabilitation section of the sports nutrition care manual published by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and has even served as a member of the United States Olympic Committee Sports Dietitian Registry. Um, what we are going to be doing tonight, so we're going to hear from Jason first, and then I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Leilani Alvarez, um, who is a veterinarian here at the Animal Medical Center. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jason. So Jason, you are up. Hello, thank you. Uh, thank you for so much for having me uh, this evening, and thank you to everyone who's taking time out of their evenings to attend. Um, I also have to give a shout out to my wife who is putting both of my kids to bed tonight without my hope. So that is major props to her. Um, so without further ado, let me pull up my uh, presentation. There we go. All right. So uh, tonight I'll be talking about dietary supplements for uh, OA. Um, in my practice, um, again, I do see a range of people, um, including those uh, kind of who are older, who have more, you know, degeneration in joints, whether it's, you know, knees, hips, shoulders, etc. And they want to continue to maintain as much function and health as possible um, as both a dietitian and as um, an exercise physiologist, you know, whether it's the exercise piece or the nutrition piece, there's always an interest in saying, well, what are the things I can do to maximize um, you know, my potential to manage inflammation, to feel better, to reduce pain uh, for my activities. So supplements inevitably come up. So um, this is a great talk to kind of get the information up there to say, okay, where is the current science and evidence for supplementation for arthritis? So I'm gonna just briefly talk about, okay, so, you know, what are the mechanisms of OA? Um, so it's important to know that, you know, it's a disease of the whole joint. Um, and then there are certain classic, uh, you know, issues within the joint that are going to be symptomatic or more likely to be symptomatic. So bone marrow lesions, uh, again, is going to be is seen in about 80% of symptomatic individuals, while only 2% uh, in non-symptomatic. So that's a key factor. Uh, you can see synovitis in about half. Um, you're going to see a lot of uh, severe cartilage loss, again, with that subchondral bone exposure below, because uh, kind of based off current evidence, you know, our cartilage is not innervated, so you're not going to get the discomfort there. But those local pain receptors, including the areas around periosteum, the subchondral bone that's open, uh, are being revealed uh, by the loss of cartilage, uh, ligament insertions, menisci, synovium, related to overuse of inflammation, all those things are kind of getting touched on or aggravated um, and creating that pain. 
Um, and again, with that prolonged exposure to discomfort or pain, there can become central sensitization where even smaller offensive factors can become very painful and chronically painful, and it can be sometimes difficult to manage that. Um, there is a formal classification, I'm not going to go into it, but that's grading how bad from zero to four, how bad the arthritis is based off, again, deformity, sclerosis of the joint, uh, joint narrowing, and osteophyte development. So really what we want to talk about is, okay, you know, in humans at least, um, you know, where is it occurring? Um, who's it happening to and, and how much is that impacting us? So again, most OA, most osteoarthritis occurs in the knee, either uh, patellofemoral or tibiofemoral. Um, also, there is a uh, significant amount in the hip, the hand, um, and the shoulder as well. Uh, but by far and away, the, the biggest incidence is in the knee. Um, again, about 32.5 million adults in the U.S. and growing as far as how many people who have OA. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's quite costly. You know, 16 and a half billion in hospitalizations, um, you know, 140 billion in total medical costs, uh, including lost time at work, et cetera. Um, and then lifetime cost of knee OA is $140,000. Um, so again, anything we can do to maintain uh, joint health um, would be tremendously helpful both for our medical system and especially for the individual who is having to live through it. Um, so again, risk factors to consider, uh, obesity being a, a significant one, um, joint injury, so a history of joint injuries. So there's a lot of good research out there saying if you've sustained an ACL injury, you have a much greater chance of uh, developing knee OA in a much sooner time than uh, those who do not. So again, that's just one example. Um, history of repetitive movements, again, taking a look at whether someone is doing similar movements in their work uh, or sitting for a long periods of time, or just, again, moving in certain ways repetitively that may be creating an inflammatory factor or degenerating an area, um, particularly if they don't move well. Um, metabolic and endocrine disease, diabetes, et cetera, um, physical activity levels and strength, so kind of being uh, sedentary and not having adequate strength can also be a factor as well, because then you're not able to stabilize your joints. Um, having OA elsewhere in the body could be a potential ind indicative factor of developing OA somewhere else. So if you have OA in one knee, possibly maybe begin OA in the other. Um, and then there's, of course, some, some non-modifiable factors, kind of just being older, uh, more wear and tear on the body, uh, female, and then also just genetic susceptibility. There is some potential factor within that, that again, we can't control, but there are plenty of uh, modifiable risk factors as well. So what I really want to do is just dive into uh, one really good uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. I think does a good job of kind of giving an overview of where the evidence is for a lot of uh, supplementation uh, for OA. Um, so this is from 2018, uh, Lou et al. Um, so this is just a kind of an overview of, okay, they, they kind of boiled it down. There's about 69 studies, uh, randomized control trials only, that were included. As you can see on the left, the bulk of those are glucosamine and chondroitin. Um, and then you have uh, diacerin, uh, avocado, soybean, and sulfonifiables, vitamin D, et cetera, and then down to even just two or one. Um, when we're looking at the supplementation, most of these studies looked at uh, knee OA, some looked at hip and knee, some hip only, and just a couple um, were hand, um, so not too many. Other factors to note of like who are the people that are in these studies, the mean age has generally been, been between 48 to 69. Again, that, you know, on the older side, uh, not looking at 20s and 30s, uh, skews female, but there is a, a male population there as well. Uh, Follow-up, uh, depending on the study, was um, anywhere from two weeks to three years. Uh, there are, you know, kind of classifying short-term, medium-term, and long-term. Uh, most studies looked short-term, uh, and then there were some that did go to medium and long-term, multiple years of follow-up um, with the individuals. Uh, from the author's representation of potential bias, they had judged that um, about seven out of the 69 were judged as low risk of bias. Um, some were, you know, about half were, or a little less than half were high, some unclear. And then 44 of the 69 studies were funded by pharmaceutical companies. So again, not to say that there is can always be biased, but just being aware that you know significant percentage were uh, funded by the companies that might have been producing the uh, substance. 
Okay, so what we want to dive into initially is just what, what are the results? What are we looking at? And so um, with some of these plots, what I like to look at is, okay, you know, you're looking at the supplementation versus the placebo, um, looking at, okay, is there statistical significance versus just trends? So um, I did highlight anything that had even a trend. Um, so again, something where that black block was to the left of the, the solid line, um, but not necessarily all the way to the left of the dotted line, which is uh, statistical significance. Um, when I go to a summary chart at the end, um, I'll kind of be uh, breaking that out a little bit more. Um, so as you can see, how glucosamine chondroitin, again, uh, more of the heavily studied uh, you know, supplements tend to be possibly favorable, possibly turning favorable, but certainly not of statistical significance. Um, as you get to the ones further down that have this statistical significance, you'll see that, of course, the number of studies are much, much less, which, of course, begs the question of uh, are these miracle supplements or are they just not studied enough to, to be up there with glucosamine and chondroitin to be like, they could help, they may not, we don't know yet. Um, so again, I, I think that's a key factor just to really understand or appreciate, you know, how many, how many studies are being, uh, are being applied here based off the results we see. Um, so this is short-term pain. Um, and then as we move to, uh, medium and long-term pain. So again, looking at, um, you know, which ones have been studied, not all of them have been studies for the medium or the long term, of course. Um, so again, as we get to the medium term pain, the undenatured type two collagen, green lip muscle extract, um, the avocado soy and supinophibles uh, tend to be a little more towards the left of the uh, significant. Um, the ASUs, uh, is just an easier way to say it than avocado soybean and supinophibles, ASUs again are toward the left, but their uh, standard deviation is still not necessarily in the significant range. Um, and then long term, again, really, there's nothing that um, on the long term side helped manage pain. Um, again, it's interesting to know that glucosamine, again, uh, was to the left entirely of that line uh, of, the, of, the, of the bold line. So they're saying there is a potential trend, uh, but again, certainly not past the um, significance factor. And then also the same thing with vitamin D. One thing that I've, I've found to be very interesting with vitamin D is that, you know, the question of whether the people getting this vitamin D supplement were in fact deficient or insufficient or whether it was just blanket vitamin D. And then, so they, they didn't necessarily stratify whether people were sufficient already or not. And I think that would be an interesting thing to note that maybe those who were deficient in vitamin D uh, would benefit um, from it. But again, there really wasn't a good amount of information to, to stratify that. Uh, the other angle that we're talking about is physical function. So again, you know, whether it's uh, quality of life, measures of movement, you know, um, ability to sit to stand, stand up and go, just different ways of measuring physical function versus just kind of straight pain. Um, and so again, as you can see, the, um, the um, supplements that have had a little more studying, uh, a little more studies can tend to be uh, less uh, efficacious by the research. Um, and then the ones with less studies, again, tend to have a little more of that uh, significance, but again, with less studies, you know, uh, so again, always worth keeping in mind. Uh, then going on to the medium and, and long-term physical function. Um, again, we're just, you now we see we kind of skew back towards that statistically insignificant or maybe trending, um, you know, maybe slight trending positive for use. Um, so again, it's just something to keep in mind that, you know, what might have some significant factors as we see on the short term doesn't always hold water as we get into these longer term multiple years. Um, as far as adverse effects, um, the only one that had um, significant or notable um, adverse effects were um, the, is diacerin. Um, and so the main, um, the main side effects there were soft stools, diarrhea, mild skin reaction, uh, irritation, and extremely rarely uh, hepatobiliary uh, issues. Um, from the research or from what some of the studies about this compound is that they consider the effectiveness similar to NSAIDs. That's what the 
study authors reported um, in, in other studies specifically looking at this specific compound. Um, all the others did not have um, any significant uh, side effects or differences. So when you take all that great information and I really want to kind of compile it all into something that's more digestible, pun intended. Um, so what I really tried to do was look at, okay, you know, given the different levels, short-term pain, long-term pain, short-term function, long-term function, which of these things were kind of statistically insignificant or maybe had some trending positive uh, and then which ones maybe were statistically significant, but their standard deviations crossed over and then which of these were statistically significant, including the standard deviations. Um, and so as you can see, you know, again, glucosamine chondroitin really tended to be um, across the board possibly trending, but not conclusive. Again, they're the ones with the most studies. Same with the diacerin. Again, that tended to be higher, more studied. Um, they also have side effects. Um, you know, MSM has some, you know, again, positive research for short-term function. Uh, the ASUs, again, some potential positive function. The undenatured type two collagen. Um, and then as you get to the ones kind of below that, especially past the uh, collagen hydrosylate and the boswellia, um, and curcumin, then you're looking at stuff with just one or two randomized controlled trials. Um, so again, you know, what it really shows is, are there some things that could possibly help? Yes. Are they all really geared to help with medium and long term? Nope. So, you know, I think we can also ask, like, are there responders and non-responders? Are there some people where they take these supplements and they just feel a thousand times better and, and they is something worth continuing for them. And then others, it just doesn't make an impact. Um, so I think these are things worth considering as well as any you know, sort of safety profile and risk profile. Uh, again, most of the studies have looked at the risk profile to be fairly low for taking these as long as there's no um, you know, so, uh, drug nutrient interactions uh, to be concerned about. One other thing I wanted to briefly touch on was um, possible food nu nutrient interventions, um, the idea of using kind of foods as medicine. Um, so this was a systematic review that looked at nine studies. What they kind of found was that higher intakes of carotenes, lutein, uh, zeaxanthin, lycopene, which are uh, polyphenols and flavon flavonoids associated with um, fruits and vegetables and other foods like that are associated with lower prevalence of cartilage defects and bone marrow lesions in the femoral head and the hip, um, again, association. There's uh, some noted reduction of inflammation with freeze dried strawberries, pomegranate juice or tart cherry juice, um, increasing growth factors in postmenopausal estrogen levels uh, with soy protein. Uh, the main takeaways I like to kind of have from this study is that get adequate, eat adequate protein, including plant-based sources like, you know, soy, tofu, edamame, et cetera. Um, and then eating adequate fruits and veggies uh, throughout your day and also maintaining a healthy body weight. Um, so again, I think there's some kind of simple takeaways that can be gleaned from complex science, um, which I like to kind of make digestible for, um, for the people that I work with. Um, one other thing that I thought was a really interesting quote um, was this uh, line or this phrase. So after controlling for age, BMI, and other commonly accepted factors, um, less physically active individuals who load their joints less develop thinner cartilage with lower, lower proteoglycan content, as well as weaker muscles responsible for protecting joints by stabilizing them and limiting joint reaction forces. Chronic low-grade inflammation, which is exacerbated by physical inactivity, Modern diets rich in highly refined carbohydrates and excessive adiposity can further magnify and accelerate loading induced damage to joint tissues. It may also directly affect NEOA pathogenesis. Um, evaluating which of these or additional features of modern environments are responsible for today's high NEOA levels is necessary. And so what they did was that they have looked at that NEOA, even controlling again for age, BMI, other factors, that, that NEOA prevalence has doubled you know, since the mid 20th century. So since the mid 1900s. So there's gotta be other things going on here that's, that's creating this, this issue for us um, over time. So when I kind of take all this together, um, you know, what I like to do, or this is kind of my game plan in my mind when I'm working with someone with um, OA, um, from a nutrition perspective, especially, but also for training. Um, first address, major modifiable risk factors. So if someone is obese, losing weight, 
um, adjusting repetitive movements, going through their day, understanding what they're doing, if they're sitting for a long time, if they're sitting and standing, if they're squatting a lot, if they're reaching a lot, um, improving general strength and nutrition. Again, really trying to look at those. Are you eating your fruits and vegetables? Are you doing strength training? Are you maintaining strong joints? Are you mobile? Um, correcting any vitamin D insufficiency or deficiency. So I do think that is one thing worth looking at, especially in the presence of OA, that if someone is insufficient or deficient in vitamin D, that getting them up to normal can definitely be helpful. Um, and then considering supplementation for one to three months of a target product and evaluate the effectiveness and monitoring for side effects. So again, if someone is really gung-ho about wanting to try supplements, we can kind of, I kind of go through my mental Rolodex of that kind of graph that I showed you with the different options. Um, and saying, okay, these are maybe some ones we can try. Um, and, and I really like to try one at a time because then I know actually what's being, the, what's impacting them. And then you can always consider, is it a placebo effect? Is it a responder versus non-responder? Um, is this the kind of person who just wants to avoid quote unquote, you know, medicine and wants to take something more quote unquote natural, which is a whole other uh, can of worms, which I can, you know, in supplements doesn't mean it's natural um, in and of itself. Um, so again, I think there's that whole concept of, of replacing other pain relievers if someone's really averse to them. Um, and then understanding whether some of these products are combination products. So if you're taking something with a, with a stack that's like six supplements at once, how do you know which of those is actually having an impact? Um, and then we also don't have any good research that looks at, okay, well, we looked at each of these one supplements individually, all right, but we haven't looked at a randomized controlled trial of you taking four of them at once and then how those interact. So again, there's so much within science that we don't know. Um, and then in the end, really understanding that again, for the vast majority of those, uh, most products don't have a ton of research behind them yet. Um, you know, just one, two, three studies. And those that do have a lot like glucosamine and chondroitin uh, are, are tend to be a little more equivocal about their true effectiveness. Um, so again, I think it's worth taking all this information with a small grain of salt and, and really trying to affect change where it can be most impactful in lifestyle medicine just as much as supplementation. And so with that, uh, my references, and I'll be happy to take questions and discussion uh, later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, and we definitely do, I see, have a lot of questions in chat already. So we are going to be taking those questions um, at the end. But first, I'd like to introduce our second speaker of the night, um, a familiar face if you were with us on Monday and Tuesday. Um, she typically hosts the One Health Conference um, this year, um, but tonight she is our speaker, and that is Dr. Leilani Alvarez. Um, so Dr. Leilani Alvarez is the director of AMC sees Tina Santi Flaherty Rehabilitation and Fitness Service and is the head of our Integrative and Rehabilitative Medicine Department. She's one of the few specialists worldwide that is board certified in canine sports medicine and rehabilitation. Her advanced training specializes her skills in the diagnosis and treatment of soft tissue injuries such as joint injuries, ligament and tendon tears, and spinal injuries. Dr. Alvarez utilizes integrative medicine, which combines modern conventional approaches with complementary and alternative medicine and includes therapies such as regenerative medicine, so stem cells and platelet-rich plasma, physical rehabilitation, acupuncture, spinal manipulation, and herbal medicine, which help to increase the overall health of a patient and can often increase the success of conventional treatments. Her research interests include soft tissue and sports injuries, geriatric medicine, joint supplements, and nutraceuticals. Um, and so without further ado, I'll take it away, Dr. Leilani Alvarez. Thank you so much, Kimberly. And it was such a pleasure to hear uh, Jason's talk. I uh, learned about uh, Jason's expertise when I was attending physiatry rounds at HSS. And uh, I have so many questions for you, Jason. So I'll have to uh, make sure I don't talk too long so we can have a good chat afterwards. Let me share my screen. And here we go. Can everybody see my screen? Yes? Yep, all good. Perfect. So. It was so wonderful to hear uh, Jason's presentation on dietary supplements from the human perspective. My role this evening is to present to you the veterinary perspective. 
I would like to thank Kimberly for helping me to organize this wonderful conference this entire week. Thank you to everybody who joined us on Monday and uh, Tuesday, and I hope that you can join us again tomorrow and Friday. I am so honored to be a member of the speaker faculty among these world-renowned speakers, both uh, veterinarians and uh, physicians and, and human specialists. So I am honored to be speaking this evening. Thank you to the One Health Institute and to the Animal Medical Center who employs me and gives me opportunities to treat uh, patients clinically, but also allows me to teach residents and interns, veterinarians, lay people, uh, and to conduct research. So very grateful to be here and be a, a part of the Animal Medical Center. Uh, the objectives for my small little talk this evening is, uh, I think it's really important for us to understand the pathophysiology of canine osteoarthritis before we can begin to talk about how to treat it. In, in particular, we're gonna be talking about its relevance to choosing dietary supplements. I'm going to be speaking to you about the current level of evidence that we have in canine joint supplements. It certainly pales in comparison to the human data. And then finally, to leave you with some advice about how to critically evaluate and choose joint supplements for your patients. So arthritis in dogs, this is by far the number one cause of chronic pain in the canine population, and this is worldwide. It affects approximately 10 to 12 million adult dogs in the United States alone. And while the condition is more commonly recognized in older dogs, it can certainly affect dogs at any age. So think about, for example, your Rottweiler that has torn their cruciate ligament at eight months of age. Uh, that is the start of osteoarthritis in that patient. Because osteoarthritis is such a slow, degenerative process, the pathophysiology and destruction of that joint can go on for years before overt clinical signs manifest in the patient. So often we estimate approximately 50% of dogs that suffer from osteoarthritis are actually undiagnosed. Approximately 20%, so that's one in every five dogs in the United States is affected by osteoarthritis. And so think about your younger patients that are at risk that have joint incongruity. So for example, dogs that have hip dysplasia or elbow dysplasia, you really want to instill preventative strategies in those patients early on. So don't wait until those clinical symptoms are evident because by then the arthritis can be quite advanced. And since we are one health this evening, it's important to speak about the differences in the pathophysiology of osteoarthritis in humans as compared to dogs. Uh, whereas typically osteoarthritis in the human athlete is trauma induced, most of the osteoarthritis that we treat in canine medicine is degenerative. Um, so there are genetic predispositions, uh, Rottweiler being one of the um, most recognized breeds, but certainly also Labrador Retriever are uh, genetically predisposed and it begins as a degenerative process. So not necessarily trauma induced. Interestingly, at uh, one of the grand rounds at HSS, it was brought up that it is now recognized that in human athletes, there may also be a degenerative component. And it was really interesting to hear that uh, human athletes that tear their ACL are also predisposed to tearing the contralateral side. In veterinary medicine, we estimate that to be approximately 50% of our patients that tear their cranial cruciate ligament uh, are prone to tearing the contralateral side. Well, it turns out that in human athletes, particularly if they return to sport very quickly, um, due to degenerative changes to the contralateral side, um, they may also um, be at higher risk for injury. But there is a major difference nonetheless, uh, which is that in our field, it's mostly a degenerative process. It's also really important to remember that osteoarthritis is not only a disease of the joint itself, it affects the periarticular structures as well. 
And so in this diagram here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, in addition to affecting the actual joint surface, uh, we get changes to the subchondral bone. Uh, you can see that this becomes a lot thicker in the osteoarthritic joint. Um, the lining of the, the synovium uh, becomes more fibrillated and thinned out. Um, we also have changes to the joint fluid itself. It becomes more watery and less elastic uh, because of loss of hyaluronic acid and, and other uh, substances. Um, and then outside of this diagram, we also have changes to the tendons uh, associated with the joint as well as muscles. Um, and of course the ligaments, especially if they're, um, you know, the cranial cruciate ligament in particular um, is very much affected. So let's say that there isn't an injury to the cranial cruciate ligament. If that joint becomes arthritic through a degenerative process, the ligament itself um, undergoes a degenerative process, which makes them more likely to tear. Um, so these are all really important concepts to remember um, as we're choosing our joint supplements. And in particular, not to get into boring um, talk about different cytokines, um, but in drug development and certainly in dietary supplements, knowing what destructive mediators are involved in the pathophysiology is important as you're choosing these supplements, not only because we want them to target it, these mediators, but also because of something that Jason brought up, uh, which is that your dietary supplements can absolutely interact with the pharmaceutical drugs you're using. So understanding the mechanism of action of that supplement might be relevant to your patient if they are also on a pharmaceutical drug that targets the same mediators. So some of the major players in OA include interleukin-1 and interleukin-6. There are multiple different matrix metalloproteases that are released that have a destructive effect in the joint and periarticular structures, as well as tumor necrosis factor alpha. And then there's lots of oxidative damage that happens in the joint as well. So keep that in mind as we go through the talk. It's important to mention when we are talking about dietary uh, joint supplements that the major driving force for information, both for the consumer and the practitioner is coming from the manufacturer. Uh, it is not from scientific studies. So be aware uh, of where the information is coming from because this is a multi-billion dollar industry and the manufacturer um, has it in their interest to educate you in such a way that makes you want to choose their product. But keep in mind that this really falls under a food category and not a drug. And so the FDA is largely resting the responsibility on the manufacturer of the supplement to verify the purity and integrity of that product um, as opposed to the FDA doing those studies. So these products are largely um, lacking in randomized controlled clinical trials. And again, it is largely unregulated compared to pharmaceutical drugs that undergo um, quite extensive, both safety and efficacy uh, randomized controlled clinical trials. Uh, on the human side, uh, hu people are spending approximately $25 billion annually on dietary supplements, and a third of that spending is on glucosamine chondroitin alone. Approximately 70% of humans that suffer from osteoarthritis are taking joint supplements to treat their condition. Um, this was actually quoted in the same study that Jason was talking about, um, that Lou study, that systematic review. I actually like to talk a lot about that study as well. So what evidence do we have on the canine side? Well, you know, Jason was saying how, you know, we, we have less trust when there's just a few studies. Uh, well, that is basically what we have on the veterinary side. We have, you know, a handful of studies on uh, particular supplements. And so I'm going to present to you what I believe to be the highest level of evidence of those very few studies that we have. Perhaps the most rigorous study uh, to date in veterinary medicine evaluating the efficacy of glucosamine and chondroitin in the canine subject suffering from osteoarthritis was published by Moreau in 2003. This involved 71 dogs. It was a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial where they evaluated the effects of glucosamine chondroitin as compared to meloxicam and carprofen. So those are both two different kinds of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And they used both subjective and 
objective outcome measures, including ground reaction forces. So this is force plate analysis. They found no benefit of glucosamine and chondroitin for dogs suffering from natural osteoarthritis in either the objective uh, outcome measures or the subjective. So meloxicam and carprofen both showed significant benefits, whereas glucosamine and chondroitin did not. In 2007, there were actually a couple of studies. Um, McCarthy um, has a study, uh, it was um, now 45 patients, so smaller number of patients, where they looked at all subjective outcome measures. So there were five subjective outcome measures where they compared glucosamine and chondroitin to the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, it was carprofen in this case. All of the five subjective outcome measures improved in the non-steroidal group. Um, and only three of the outcome measures improved in the glucosamine conjointin group. Um, again, quite a bit of subjectivity when you're only looking at subjective outcome measures um, and no objective outcome measures. Uh, but again, the results of that study were that all of the measures improved in the non-steroidal group and three of the five improved in the glucosamine conjointin group. Um, and then there are a couple of other studies I didn't mention in here, but there was a systematic review. So this is highest level of evidence where we take all of the studies to date and evaluate each of the clinical trials and run statistics on those tests to see what conclusions can we make. And so in 2012, uh, Van der Weerd published in JVEM, the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine, a systematic review of oral supplements to treat uh, osteoarthritis. And the conclusion was that the overall evidence for glucosamine chondroitin in treating osteoarthritis was poor. Um, some of the same reasons that we see on the human side because they're sponsored by companies or um, there's a lot of um, subjectivity, uh, the studies are not well conducted, et cetera. Um, there is a more recent study that was published in 2017 in VCOT by Scott. Um, in this study, they compared glucosamine chondroitin to placebo and it actually went out longer for 90 days. So the Moreau study went out to 60 days. Um, the Antillo study went out to 70 days. Uh, some of the human studies have shown that a uh, longer period of taking the supplement might yield more efficacy. And so this study went out for 90 days, but they found no benefit for glucosamine chondroitin um, when taken for 90 days. Um, so there is the evidence on the canine side. I would argue that uh, we don't have great evidence to support the use of glucosamine chondroitin for the treatment of osteoarthritis in dogs. Um, that said, um, all of these studies showed that it was very well tolerated uh, with no significant adverse effects. Um, and just as our uh, human counterpart was mentioning, I think there are responders or at least humans that believe their dog is responding. And so if I have a patient whose owner believes their dog was much better on glucosamine chondroitin, I have no issue whatsoever with them continuing it because I know it's not gonna harm the patient. Where do we have more evidence? I saw several questions already about omega-3 fatty acids and I'm very curious to know Jason's uh, feedback on this because in veterinary medicine, by far the most robust evidence, the highest level of evidence for supporting the use of dietary supplementation for the treatment of osteoarthritis is omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and it is from the fish source. The fish source is better than the plant source. Um, and that is because it's a richer source of EPA and DHA and is more absorbable in our patients. Um, there are multiple anti-inflammatory effects. So here come up those destructive mediators that we spoke about in the pathophysiology. So omega-3 fatty acids um, down-regulate the production of IL-1 and IL-6, as well as those matrix metalloproteases. It also actually inhibits COX-2, which is what NSAIDs uh, block, as well as 5-lipooxygenase and tumor necrosis factor alpha. This might be a reason why omega-3s are so effective because because they block a lot of those same destructive mediators that are involved in the pathophysiology of osteoarthritis. Um, and as I said, we do have multiple canine studies demonstrating efficacy, but here's something really interesting, and I, I wonder if Jason is gonna agree with me, but when I was delving into the human literature and the systematic reviews, I actually really enjoy, there's a paper also by Lou that talks about the traffic light system, where you can just look at a paper and clinicians 
can easily see whether a supplement is recommended or not, whether a therapy is recommended. So if it's recommended, it's in green. Uh, if it's in between, it's yellow. And if we definitely don't think it's gonna help, it's gonna be in red. Um, and I was astounded that omega-3 fatty acids are not on the green zone, uh, which for us, they would be, right? That for us in veterinary medicine, we know omega-3 fatty acids are effective for treating osteoarthritis, at least based on multiple clinical trials that showed both subjective and objective outcome measures that improved. And so I was, I was just puzzled and I thought, why would the evidence be different in veterinary medicine and then human medicine? And then a little light bulb went off and I realized that when I pulled up all of the veterinary papers, paper after paper after paper showing evidence for omega-3s helping, they were all in the diet. So these very, very high doses of omega-3 fatty acids are put in the food, in the kibble, right? So the dog is eating high doses of omega-3 fatty acids. And why might it be not as effective if you give it as a separate oral supplement? Well, to get that nice, potent anti-inflammatory effect, you need very high doses of these EPAs and DHAs. So we need upwards of at least 50 mg per kg of EPA. Uh, and if you're using combined EPA and DHA, we really like to get up to approximately 300 mg per kg. At least that's what the um, companies used in the diets that they tested. And guess what happens when you give that to your patients as a separate oral supplement? You're going to get massive diarrhea. Um, so by and large, these very high high doses of omega-3 fatty acids are just not tolerated. You get steratorrhea um, and bad breath and all, all sorts of side effects. So people end up giving much lower doses that I suspect are sub-therapeutic. Um, and so I suspect that is why on the human side, it's not more commonly recommended because you'd be needing to take these very, very high doses. And the reason why it works in the diet is because they can mix it in with fiber and, and other dietary components that makes it more digestible and more tolerable uh, for our canine patients to have these high doses without having massive diarrhea. So food for thought on that one. Eggshell membrane is another up and coming supplement uh, for which we have just a couple of clinical trials, but it is showing promise on the veterinary side. Um, eggshell membrane um, comes from that little thin membrane. You know, when you crack open an egg, that little thin membrane inside um, happens to be naturally very rich in proteins, approximately 88% protein content, primarily desmazine and isodesmazine, which are natural sources of elastin and collagen, which of course helps to provide elasticity and important for supporting those periarticular structures. So remember we were talking about the importance of tendons and muscles and ligaments in maintaining joint integrity and that's really what eggshell membrane is thought to help. Um, we have a nice um, multi-center randomized controlled clinical trial with 51 dogs um, that showed improvements um, both on veterinary evaluation and owner assessment of quality of life um, going out six weeks. And then another study where eggshell membrane was compared to the effects of meloxicam, and we saw improvements in the canine brief pain inventory score, um, as well as improvement in um, activity as measured by an accelerometer. Um, and this went out for four weeks. Um, and um, for both of these clinical trials, they found that there were no adverse effects. Curcumin is one that comes up a lot, um, as you may have seen from the studies that Jason presented there. Uh, we do see that uh, curcumin um, has some studies on the human side supporting efficacy. Uh, this is a, an extract from turmeric. Um, so it's a tuber. You might recognize it in Indian cooking. That's what gives it that wonderful uh, yellow color to your curries. It's been used for centuries in traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine uh, and studied quite extensively. It is known to have a very potent anti-inflammatory and also anti-neoplastic effect. The problem with curcumin is it has extremely low bioavailability, less than 1% percent that's ingested orally is actually going to get absorbed. So while in the Petri dish, 
Um, we see these wonderful anti-inflammatory and anti-neoplastic effects. Clinically, we're not seeing the same level of benefit. And perhaps the best study that demonstrated that on the canine side uh, was a study published in 2003 by INES uh, with 61 dogs, randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial, where they saw no improvement in the peak vertical force of the dogs that were taking curcumin as compared to placebo. Green lip mussel uh, is an organism that grows naturally in New Zealand. Uh, the scientific name is Perna canuliculus. Uh, it also is known to have multiple anti-inflammatory effects, uh, blocking five lipooxygenase, COX-1 and 2. Um, so again, um, some of the same mediators we were talking about in OA. Um, and in addition to having uh, EPA and DHA, it also has ETA, so that's eicosatetraenoic acid. Um, so it has multiple anti-inflammatory free fatty acids, so more so than your traditional fish-based omega-3 fatty acids, in addition to glucosaminoglycans. Um, we believe that the, there's a synergistic effect of the whole extract. So in other words, you know, really extracting this whole green lip muscle and giving all of the contents is more effective than just giving one particular extract like the ETA, for example. Um, and then that same systematic review that I mentioned earlier that was published, um, three out of the four randomized controlled clinical trials in dogs showed um, significant benefit in clinical uh, benefits of osteoarthritis in dogs. Um, so we're seeing, again, a greater level of evidence than glucosamine chondroitin. And here's one of my favorite supplements to use for patients because it's not just good for osteoarthritis, um, but is a really potent antioxidant. So this is astaxanthin. Um, this comes from red marine algae, so it's naturally sourced, very potent antioxidant. Uh, we have multiple studies uh, supporting efficacy in the dog. Uh, one study showing improved immune response, another one showing its um, age-related benefits and antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects. And interestingly, these effects were greater in the geriatric patients than the young patients. So that's particularly the population that we tend to see present clinically with OA is our older dogs. And of course, they also have oxidative damage from aging um, and oxidative damage from cancers. Um, so the astaxanthin can be a really powerful supplement for our older patients, um, not just with OA. And another randomized clinical trial that was in exercise conditioned dogs. So these were sled dogs. Um, and uh, for those of you who are, are not familiar, the energy source uh, for endurance athletes in canines is different than in people. So people rely a lot on carbohydrate source, um, but in dogs, they rely primarily on triglycerides as their primary source of energy to complete these um, Iditarods and these um, you know, thousand mile races uh, that they do. And in order to maintain that level of exercise, they need to maintain those triglyceride levels. So astaxanthin was shown to improve their pre-exercise triglyceride levels and decrease their post-glucose uh, drop post-exercise. So meaning they were able to maintain their glycogen stores, which then prepares them to exercise again. So in essence, um, this is evidence that astaxanthin may help to mitigate exercise-induced fatigue and improve exercise performance. Uh, an important thing to mention as we're talking about dietary supplements is, is oral bioavailability. I already mentioned it regarding curcumin. When we're talking about macronutrients, so carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, these have a very high bioavailability. So greater than 90% of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats that are ingested are going to be absorbed. But when we talk about um, micronutrients, so these are your trace minerals, vitamins, and bioactive phytochemicals um, like astaxanthin or um, you know, these other uh, phytochemicals that are used in dietary supplements, that bioavailability can vary quite widely. So I think all of us, as we went through veterinary school or medical school or technician school, you learned about pharmacokinetics. Um, and we know this for practically every drug that is out there because it's studied. Um, and we know we talk about the Tmax curve and the Cmax, and we understand 
how that drug is absorbed, how long it lasts, and this helps us in deciding dosing. Well, by and large, we don't know anything about this information in most of our supplements. And most importantly, um, the bioavailability of many of these supplements is very low even if it has been studied, many of which it actually hasn't been studied. So here's just an example of the known bioavailability in dogs. So the bioavailability of glucosamine in dogs is only 12%, chondroitin sulfate 5%, curcumin is less than 1%, and then transdermal supplements uh, can be quite variable anywhere from zero to 15%. So this might help explain why a lot of the in, in vitro studies of glucosamine chondroitin showed efficacy, but then when we do the clinical trials, we just don't see that same level of clinical benefit and it might have to do with bioavailability. So how do we critically evaluate supplements? How do we choose supplements. You, you might think after these talks that maybe we just shouldn't be giving supplements at all. Um, I don't think that's true. I think that there are some supplements, but above all else, I think, you know, we, we want safe supplements. And then of course we would like for them to be efficacious too. So here's my advice to you. I think that we should be holding supplements to the same pharmaceutical standards, right? You wouldn't put a patient on a drug if you had no you know, no knowledge of the pharmacokinetics, um, you know, how absorbable it is, um, you know, what are the side effects? Is it safe? Uh, so the questions that you would ask for a pharmaceutical drug, you should also be asking for a dietary supplement. You want there to have been demonstrated bioavailability, safety, and efficacy. I personally am looking for in vivo studies that demonstrate efficacy. Uh, and you want this to be a rigorous study. You want it to be a double blind, placebo controlled, randomized controlled clinical trial, just like we do for pharmaceutical drugs. And you want it to be on the whole product. A lot of these supplements are combination products that have a lot of different ingredients in it. Uh, whereas the studies tend to be on the single uh, herb, the products are often combination products. And just as Jason mentioned, we don't know what effect they have on each other. Are they synergistic or are they antagonistic? Uh, do we get new side effects that we wouldn't have had if we didn't put them together? So really you want there to have been a study on the whole supplement. And most importantly, in my opinion, it should be on the species that you're using it in. So I love to talk about human studies, but humans are not dogs and dogs are not cats and cats are not pigs and, and, and pigs are not birds. Uh, so, you know, if we're starting to use supplements on other species, we know, we know as veterinarians that bioavailability and digestibility is very variable across species. So choose supplements that have randomized controlled clinical trials in your species that you intend to use it for. And ideally that has tested it for the condition that you're going to treat it for, which in our case here would be osteoarthritis. And choose a well-established company. You want the company to be doing quality testing. Again, the FDA is not following up with them. So I really insist that any supplements I recommend have third-party laboratory testing. At the very least, you want a certificate of analysis. That's what the COA is here, certificate of analysis, where they are using a third-party laboratory to verify what is in there. What, you know, what's the amount of vitamin D in there or copper or um, has it been tested for salmonella contamination or any other heavy metal contaminations? That's particularly important for your omega-3 fatty acids is heavy metal contamination. Um, on the veterinary side, uh, we have the National Animal Supplement Council label. This is a nonprofit organization that will do audits on these companies um, and will verify the ingredient list. On the human side, that's the good manufacturing practice label. Um, and there's also the USP, the US Pharmacopedia. So you wanna look for one of these labels to help give you more assurance and trust in the product that you're choosing. And then finally for our species, um, because we're not, you know, our species are not humans and you can't just tell them to eat something or swallow it even if it tastes terrible. Um, I like to choose supplements that are really easy to dose and are highly palatable because I don't wanna be shoving pills down their throat. I'd like for them to eat it and it not be a big hassle. 
Okay. Um, here are some tips that are actually recommendations by the FDA on how to choose supplements. Um, so they really recommend thinking about when you are looking on Google, which is how most consumers decide what supplement they want to give to their pet, um, is who is running that site? Is it the manufacturer of the supplement or is it a more reputable agency like a government agency, say like the CDC, uh, or is it a university like for example, the Mayo Clinic has a wonderful resource about supplements, um, or is it another reputable health agency? So you really want to look for that type of information and try not to get the information from the manufacturer themselves, because obviously there's a lot of bias there. And what is the purpose of the website? Is the purpose of the website to advertise a product or is the purpose of the website to educate? And then what is the source of the information? You would be astounded. A lot of these manufacturers will quote studies and then I'll go and I'll try to pull up the study that they quote and it doesn't exist. It wasn't published. And I call them up and they say, oh yeah, that's a uh, proprietary information. But on their website, it looks like it's a published study and then it doesn't exist. So do your homework. Um, and if the company is quoting a study, make, make sure that that is actually an authentic reference. Um, and then is the information current? You don't really want studies quoted from the 1970s or even the 80s. You want some you know, fresh, perspective in vivo studies um, as opposed to outdated information. And then finally, remember that a lot of these companies use consumer anecdotes to say about how the product had such a miracle effect on their dog, but realize that their best friends or their extended family members could have written that. Um, that is not verified by anybody. So consumer anecdotes is really the absolute lowest level of evidence. Um, you can write anything you want that somebody supposedly said. Um, so really do not trust consumer anecdotes as a reliable source of information. And then finally, if you are looking for some reliable way to compare products and what studies are out there, um, there are two um, good sites, uh, one which is put on by the uh, National Institutes of Health, that is the Dietary Supplement Label Database. Um, I give you the website right there, um, www.dsld. Dot nlm dot nih dot gov. That is a free site. Um, and then there's also consumerlab.com that does require a yearly subscription, but it's quite affordable. I think it's like $42 for the year. Um, and it's really a wealth of information about the various supplements that are out there. Um, and so in closing, um, these are my five tips to leave you with on how to choose joint supplements. Um, so I prefer to choose companies that have been in business for at least 10 years uh, because they have the money and the resources to do quality assurance and third-party laboratory testing. Um, I absolutely must see that they have independent testing that is outside of the manufacturer. I would like to see proven bioavailability of the product uh, with in vivo randomized controlled clinical trials in the species that I am using it in and with demonstrated efficacy for osteoarthritis. So um, there that you will find that not many supplements will actually meet all of those criteria, but that is what I look for for my patients. And with that, I would like to open it up for questions. Let's see, okay. There's been so many questions. <laughs> uh, let me start off, Jason, by asking you, um, what is your take on omega-3 fatty acids? Because it's what we most commonly use in veterinary medicine. Yeah, so I mean, it's a really good question. And actually, if you look at how much research is done for humans in OA specifically, there's not a lot of research surprisingly done specifically within the realm of osteoarthritis and omega-3 use. There's tons of research in regards to inflammation, you know, kind of interleukins, prostaglandins, and how they have that, you know, positive effect. Uh, I apologize for any uh, chaos going on outside again. M much props to my wife for handling all this um, tonight. But um but, you know, there's not a lot out there. And I think that's probably why Lou listed it not as a green yet. There's just not a lot. There is, um, there's a review of potential uh, effectiveness by, um, is it 2019? Let me pull it up, I think. Um, 
Um, is the best thing I had found previously when I was doing the research here by Wolf at all uh, in joint, bone, and spine in July 2019. That talked about the potential for omega-3 fatty acids to be helpful, um, but still there's not robust studies like to that level, you know, of your five tips, like your five guidelines, like it's not there yet. Um, yeah. Other things to be aware of, at least on the human side for omega-3 fatty, fatty acids is dosing. Uh, high doses can lead to bleeding risk, especially those who uh, are at risk of, of that or on blood thinners, Coumadin, et cetera. And then also high doses of omega-3s in, in humans has sometimes been shown to suppress the immune system because of that kind of overload of anti-inflammatory compounds. So a lot of the research, at least if you are going to try offering uh, omega-3 as a anti-inflammatory compound for, for a human, we usually try to start around anywhere from one to three grams. Um, you'll see higher doses in like, cardi like cardiovascular and cardiology for people with heart disease, uh, but for just general inflammation, one to three grams tends to be where we started with. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, I talk about that too, and I didn't mention it in this talk, but you know, a lot of our patients, uh, let's say, will take, you know, they'll be on high doses of omega three fatty acids. Um, then they are also on a polysulfated glucosaminic glycan, which at high doses can also have platelet inhibiting effects. Then mm -hmm. they're also on a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, which also has platelet inhibiting effects. Um, yeah. And yeah, and so it has a cumulative effect. And at, to your point, we don't have studies that look at these things together. Curcumin is the other one. Um, you know, you take all of these together and I think you do have an increased bleeding risk. And we have seen it actually. We've had patients in the ICU um, that have have prolonged bleeding postoperatively, and um, they 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 ask our team to come in and look at them, and and then I see all the multiple things that they're taking, and I'm like, well, the the, the increased bleeding might might have to do with the multiple supplements that they're taking. So that's a really good point to think about. Uh, and even in dogs, dentals, you know, they'll go and have a dental procedure, and so uh, we do recommend stopping those high doses of omega three fatty acids and their polysulfated glucosamine glycans that, that we, we give injectably quite commonly. The product is called Adequan. Um, and especially when you're giving those together, you, you can see increased bleeding. Um, I'm gonna try to read, please ask me, Jason, if you have questions, I'm gonna try to scroll through. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of questions here. Thank you guys. We've have a tremendous participation from the audience here and tons of questions. <laughs> so let's yeah. see. Um, People are asking for a dose of astaxanthin. I don't know, Jason, is that a product that you're using or recommending? I have to be honest with you. I don't have a specific dose. I, the, the, product, the, the astaxanthin that I use is from a supplement that was prospectively studied and I know is bioavailable. So I just mm -hmm. give that supplement, but I don't know, um, Jason, if you have a particular dose. No, I really, I mean, I tend to recommend things like astaxanthin and, and zeaxanthin and lutein in the, in the context of fruits and vegetables and just eating the foods that, that are naturally rich. Them. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I did a, when someone had asked a question, I did a quick look up in the, in the literature and it looks like um, a lot of the research, um, at least for humans, again, the recommended dosage range is typically in this like six to 10 milligrams per day if you are going to take supplementation for it. Um, and again, it, it is a subcompound of vitamin A, it's a carotene. So again, you know, not having too much either is something to be considerate of or taking with a meal. So again, you know, I really don't use it as a supplement much in practice or really that I've seen at all. Um, I really just recommend people that like kind of eat the foods that have it because that's always a funny thing too. I mean, you can go back to like yeah. Yeah. the select study in smoking, when then you hyper dosed a certain supplement, it was negative, but if you just eat the foods that have it, it's usually It's helpful. positive, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a difference in our professions, which is that, you know, we don't tell our patients to, you know, eat blueberries and raspberries. Exactly, <laughs> there's a difference. Um, but there is a, a question here, which I will answer is, um, they're asking what is the recommended dose of vitamin D in canine patients? I'll tell you that if you feed an AFCO approved diet, um, you will get the appropriate amount of vitamin D. So we don't have the issue with vitamin D deficiency in our species that we see in humans, because if you're feeding a commercial diet, it's already balanced with vitamin D. So 
Um, there is some newer research looking at, should we be giving more vitamin D based on the human research and the multiple disorders that have been um, associated? I know there was one study, Jason, that looked at that uh, vitamin D three deficient patients were three times more likely to get knee osteoarthritis. So mm -hmm. um, there certainly is that correlation on the human side. I, I, you mm -hmm. know, I don't think we see that clinically in our patients, again, because they're eating commercial diets that are already have appropriate amounts of vitamin D. And also the big difference with vitamin D3 is that in people, you know, we rely on um, sun absorption and skin absorption, and that's not the case in dogs. It's um, the sources is, is, is oral and it's digested. So mm -hmm. dogs don't need to sit and sunbathe to get their vitamin D3. So, um, so I think that addresses that question. Uh, let's see. It says, somebody says, although it makes more sense that OA can cause destructive effect to cruciate ligaments, why do we not see more cruciate ruptures in older dogs? Uh, that's an interesting question. I, I think um, what happens in these older patients is they have so many comorbidities um, and they have joint laxity, um, not just in their knees, but it can happen in other joints. Um, that I think it's under-recognized. And, you know, in our younger patients, there's a very obvious acute lameness, whereas in the older dog, they're slowing down, they're not getting up. And, uh, you know, I think we don't recognize what I suspect is micro tears and a lot of degenerative changes that don't present as acutely as it does in our younger patients. I don't know, Jason, um, how, you, how that's presented on the human side. As far as like ACL incidence rates when in, in an older population, yeah. I mean, a lot of ACL tears in, in, you know, humans are usually due to an acute situation, you know, usually yeah. kind of trauma. pivot, trauma, you know, so usually I kind of, when you're super young, you're usually playing a field sport or court sport. When you're middle age, you're usually skiing. Then when you're older, you're usually doing enough, fast enough, hard enough to actually tear something. You'll wear something else down before you blow your ACL. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. Uh, I have seen older people, but it's rare. Yeah. There's a, there's a great question here. <laughs> How do we dose these supplements where the dose has no research on pharmacokinetics? <laughs> so I'm happy that the audience was listening because yeah, I think, I think Jason and I are like, yeah, you don't know. It, it's just guesswork. And um, which is why I think both Jason and I agree that, you know, choose things that are evidence-based. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think on the human side, eat well. Um, you don't want to be heavy. I mean, it's true for our patients, you know, the, the most important management for osteoarthritis, which by the way, our talk tomorrow with Dr. Kristen Kirkby um, and Dr. Um, Kat McKenna, McKelleny from HSS, they're going to be, I'm sorry, it's Dr. Hooper, Dr. Hooper tomorrow, they're going to be talking about osteoarthritis management, chronic management, but weight management is the most important. And we have a wealth of evidence, um, both on the veterinary side and the human side that, you know, you don't want to be obese. So I, I always laugh because I have these clients come in and they're, and they have a bag full of supplements and they're giving their dog all this stuff and their dog is morbidly obese. And I tell them, I'm like, you don't need to give any supplements. You just need to feed your dog less. <laughs> but, um, you know, to answer your question, Suzanne, um, we don't know the dose. And I, I rely on people like Jason, um, Dr. Joe Wachschlag, you know, nutritionist, um, you know, because they do this nice, they, they try to compile the information together and try to come up with guidelines on what the doses are. But the reality is that the evidence is poor. We just don't have a very high level of statistically significant, um, certainly on, on a high level of systematic review where we can say definitively, this is the right dose you should take and that it will work. We just don't have that evidence. Um, Jason, do you, do you agree with my statements? Yeah, I mean, I think for any of this is like, you know, we looked at the randomized control trials to see what dosages are giving and what outcomes are getting. And so it's, it's almost more like if they're doing this and it has a positive effect, how much are they dosing them? That's probably what we're going to start. And then we just have to wait for subsequent research to titrate down if it's more effective at a lower dose or anything else. But we really are beholden to the research as far as that goes. And like you said, if there's no research or scant research then you're really just trying to go with what's available. Um, otherwise, I just, I don't see the, um, 
I don't know. I, the risk reward profile changes a lot when you don't have much research to base it off because then God forbid I do something, you know, first do no harm. I, I don't want to make recommendations on something you know, just because it's new and cutting edge and then God forbid something happens. Um, I, I don't want to be responsible for that. Um, I'm going to hop in quickly too because I know you're talking about uh, many like kind of making sure manufacturing is appropriate. Uh, two other things, at least in the sports nutrition world where I am, and they do some of these other supplements, not all of them. Um, I do love Consumer Lab, by the way. I am I am a subscriber too. Um, I use NSF for sport, National Science Foundation um, for sport. So NSF certification, NSF for sport, and then also informedchoice.org. Those are also third party manufacturer testing for, uh, at least on the human side, uh, supplementation uh, for things, again, to make sure that companies are allowing batches of their product to be tested. Oh, that's great. Thank you for that. That's awesome. Uh, there's a question about what do we recommend for felines? Um, I will take that question. My favorite is omega-3 fatty acids because a lot of our uh, feline friends who have osteoarthritis are older and so they have comorbid chronic renal failure. And we know that omega-3 fatty acids benefit renal function in addition to benefiting their joints. So that is by far my favorite dietary supplement for feline OA is omega-3 fatty acids. I will also off-label, you can use Adequan. I tend to lower the dose to three mg per kg as opposed to the canine dose 4.4 mg per kg because it can have, um, it's recommended to, to, to be cautious with renal disease. And again, because of the comorbidity with chronic renal failure, I tend to lower the dose in cats, but just realize that that is off-label use. Um, and then first and foremost, again, weight management. Most of our indoor only cats are very overweight. And so putting them on a weight loss diet is usually the most effective at managing their OA. But as far as supplements, omega-3 fatty acids. Let's see, uh, where can we find doses for astaxanthin? I will try to find some doses for you. Um, I know Dr. Um, Schmalberg um, out of University of Florida, he published a paper, I wanna say in veterinary compendium where he did provide doses. Um, so I can try to get that to you guys. Um, somebody asked about Antonel for dogs. So Antonel is green lip muscle. I do like that supplement. Um, are there particular diets rich in um, omega-3 fatty acids that you recommend, uh, which were used in the studies? That's a good question. So um, the major companies that did these studies was Hills, Purina, and also Royal Canine. So those are the top three. And so for uh, Hills, the original diet was JD, joint diet. I will say that JD is very heavy in carbohydrates. So I had a lot of patients get heavy on JD. So so that's not helpful. So I don't like JD, but they have a newer diet called metabolic mobility, uh, which is, it actually has some nice, uh, Jason might be interested in this. It has um, tomato pumice and uh, flaxseed and uh, I forget. There's some other natural ingredients which are meant to promote uh, improvement in metabolism and weight loss. So that is combined with a diet that is higher in protein, higher in fiber and lower in carbohydrate um, with also a very rich omega-3 uh, fatty acid profile. I love that diet. I have tons of patients who arrive to me heavy with multiple joint osteoarthritis. I put them on a diet and usually within two months, um, I'm able to achieve significant weight loss uh, and improvement in their clinical symptoms. I might try that with some of my people. It sounds like a good blend, more protein, more fiber, not too much carbs. It's, you know, it sounds I about know. right. You just got to hand them the bag and you're done. I you know, so if it were that easy with humans, sometimes I wonder. Well, then you have the humans that, you know, feed the table foods and the treats mm -hmm. and the biscuits and, you know. And I don't know why they're not losing weight. <laughs> I swear I only feed a half a cup. And it's like, well, what else are you feeding? Um, anyway, um, yeah. So for Purina, it's the overweight management, OM. And for, um, oh, uh, but then they also have JM, joint management diet. Um, that joint management is not a weight loss diet. Um, so first and foremost, lose the weight. Don't worry too much about the joint supplements, worry about the weight loss. And then uh, Royal Canine has JS, joint joint support. 
Um, so that's, those are, those are my top three picks. And uh, what else? Um, what are your thoughts on EPA DHA in terms of oxidation from being in a bottle as opposed to gel caps? Um, Jason, do you have a response on that? I, I, I definitely have a, an opinion on that. <laughs> I'll, I'll defer to you at this point with it. Um, I, you know, I just try to look for supplements that have, um, you know, that are kind of positively reported on in consumer labs or have good third party testing. Um, and I kind of go by with what the dosage is on the bottle, but I'm, I'm all ears about more in depth feelings. Yeah. So, well, as regarding the, I think this question is regarding the oxidation that occurs because of the fatty acids. And so they mm -hmm. basically, they become stale uh, yeah. and it is a major issue that we have because omega-3 supplementation is so common in veterinary medicine. So you absolutely want to, um, most of these products are combined with vitamin E, uh, which helps with that oxidative, um, delay the oxidation that takes place. And I will tell you that some people will put it in the refrigerator. I think that that can help. And then definitely smell, like if you're giving a supplement, mm. smell the bottle, it will smell rancid. And if it smells rancid, you should not give it. But this this absolutely does happen with the fatty acid supplementation. Um, so uh, for sure. Uh, let's see what else. What do you think about the consideration of early spay neuters versus OA in joint health later in life? That is a hot topic. Um, but you know, uh, I think all of Jason's patients, none of them are spayed or neutered. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> we know that um, both estrogen and testosterone are important for joint integrity, uh, ligaments and tendons. Um, and we have, we do have definitive data that has showed a higher incidence of at least cruciate ligament tears um, in spayed and neutered dogs, um, you know, so then you just really get into risk versus benefit. Um, I would say that for your male dogs, as long as they're not aggressive, I think keeping them intact can uh, promote better joint health. For the females, of course, we worry about mammary carcinoma. And so I, I will leave it up to your primary veterinarian to advise you on that. Um, my, my personal advice, because I do specialize in musculoskeletal disorders is let them go into the first heat, but not thereafter. So spay them after the first heat. But I, I don't want to speak. I'm, I'm not the authority. I'm not speaking for the Animal Medical Center. That's my personal opinion. Um, but that is based on some of the latest evidence. Uh, interestingly, um, at HSS, um, there, uh, that was one of the speakers that I was trying to get to talk about the hormonal influ influences um, on, on joint disease, because it, it is an interesting topic for women who are, you know, during different parts of their cycle are at their greater risk for injury and that that has been demonstrated. So it's a very interesting topic. Let's see, of the dozen vitamin D serum tests I have submitted all were low. Oh, interesting. I also submitted one patient's serum to Michigan State to compare vitamin D test accuracy. It was spun on. I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing this is a veterinarian who's saying that. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> Let's see, um, does concurrent use of curcumin supplement and an NSAID increase the risk of GI side effects ulceration? Yes, uh, but it depends if the curcumin is bioavailable. Um, I know, uh, Jason, I don't know if you recommend, it's talked about a lot to use uh, black pepperine to increase bioavailability in people for curcumin. We don't have that evidence and I don't recommend people add black pepper to their dog's food <laughs> to increase curcumin bioavailability. But um, um, I can answer. Yeah. I also will probably have to have hop off in about three minutes. Yeah, um, no worries. I know but, you have um, your... I'll be in three minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but I will say, yeah, there is a lot of formulation with uh, pipe. Um, so black pepper, also uh, a source of fat, can also help carry it as well. So. Um, so between the, the, the fat and the, and the black pepper for humans as well can be a way to help uh, improve absorption. Yeah, yeah. Well, with that, I think um, we probably should wrap it up. We're supposed to be ending at eight o'clock. Uh, thank you, Jason, so much for your time and expertise this evening. Uh, it was a lot of fun for me. And uh, I could talk about this all night long, um, but we both have sure. children that are waiting on us. <laughs> and, I, and I will say too, you know, if there are latent questions in the chat, 
um, you know, and, and people want to get answers. If we want to compile them, I'm happy to take a look at ones, at least ones that are pertinent to, to human on the human side. I'm happy to try to bang out some answers over the next couple of days and get it to you guys. So, so I want everyone who's on and who's asked a question, you know, I'm, I'm happy to help get some answers if I can provide them. That's so nice. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and again, for the rest of our audience members, uh, tomorrow we have Dr. Kristen Kirkby and Dr. Hooper speaking on um, osteoarthritis, chronic osteoarthritis management. So please uh, join us tomorrow at 7 p.m. And um, I don't know if uh, Kimberly has any other closing remarks. No, I just want to say thank you. Um